Welcome to Recollections, the Middle Tennessee Voices of Their Time series. A look at the past through the experiences of Middle Tennesseans. This is Bob Bullen along with Bob Womack of Middle Tennessee State University with our guest, four-star general and retired Marine Corps Commandant Leonard Fielding Chapman, Jr. and his wife, Emily. The Chapmans now spend part of their time residing at their ancestral home in Bedford County in Fairfield. General Chapman's career began back in the 1930s and he became a veteran in World War II of several important combat actions, including the Coral Sea, Midway, Peleliu, and Okinawa. After the war, the, the general began his successful climb up the military ladder of, of uh, command with, uh, com with, with duty in Japan. He served as assistant chief of staff, chief of staff, assistant commandant, and then Commandant during the Vietnam War from 1968 to 1972. After the war, he served as Director of the Immigration and Naturalization Service under President Nixon. Mrs. Chapman has a, quite a Nashville background. She was raised uh, part of the time with her grandmother, uh, Mrs. Walton, Pauline Walton Ford, at, at a home that's known to most Middle Tennesseans, Glen Echo, out on Gallatin Road. And now the general and Mrs. Chapman spend their time with their uh, grandchildren, and the general spends part of his time working on with various boards and agencies around the country and making speeches to various civics, civic groups. Mrs. Chapman, uh, I noticed that you and the general have lived quite an exciting life together, but Dr. Womack and I got the definite impression that you worked as a team together, so you've met a lot of people in your career, haven't you? Yes, I spent 35 years as a Marine Corps wife moved 23 times, had two children and carried them around, and we met many interesting people. So General, you made a good marriage and that helped out, didn't it? It helped a whole lot, yes. Bob, Bedford County seems to be becoming a focal point in Tennessee for distinguished military people, and that's your old hometown and yes. county. <clears throat> I visited the Rotary Club over there not long ago, and that's the first time I'd ever seen General Chapman. There was General Chapman, there was General Schaffner, there was a, an Admiral King, there was a general from Tullahoma. It looked like a retired officer's club <laughs> over there in, in the Rotary. Let's talk a little bit about your ancestral home, General. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the home built on the river there and uh, how it has played a part in your life. Well, it's on the uh, little Garrison River, which flows into the duck near Shelbyville, at a little place called Fairfield, which is now just a crossroad, was once a uh, thriving farm community with two stores and a blacksmith shop and a mill. The old place was built as a tavern on the uh, trace from Nashville to Chattanooga, sometime before 1800, we think about 1790. It was acquired by my great-great-great-grandfather, who was a country doctor. Came from Murfreesboro, went to medical school at Vanderbilt, and he set up in a country practice there in the old place at Fairfield. Later, uh, just before the Civil War started, he built the house, the, the new house, we call it, built about 1860 in front of the old house, built about 1790, and the two are joined by a long porch. It passed uh, from him down through his son and uh, my mother, his daughter, granddaughter, and then to me and to Emily. And uh, I, uh, over many years, since I was a little boy, three years old, have lived there at first uh, year round, and then later every summer for many, many years now. Uh, and uh, in recent years, we've come to move down here from uh, Virginia every June. We live at Fairfield in the old place, June, July, sometimes into August. And that's where we are now, this summer. Was it your grandfather who was a member of the 17th Tennessee Confederate Regiment? Yes, he was born right there at Fairfield, uh, the son of a country doctor. When he was 17 years old, he enlisted in the 17th Tennessee he went with that regiment up into Kentucky, several of the actions up there, to the Battle of Shiloh over on the Mississippi, and then later here at Murfreesboro in the Battle of Stones River, where he was hit in the 
left knee with a mini ball. Had, his leg was amputated. Uh, my great grandmother, from just 12 miles away at Fairfield, drove over in her buggy and found him on the battlefield. Got permission from the Yankees, who had control of the battlefield at the end of that battle, as everyone knows. Took him back to Fairfield and nursed him and back to sufficient health that he was able to travel, at which point he was honor bound to turn himself back into the federal authorities, and he did, and spent the rest of the war in two different prison camps in Ohio and New Jersey. At the end of that, of the war, of course, as everyone knows, of course, the prison gates were just open and the prisoners were free to return, and he hobbled all the way back to Fairfield on one <laughs> leg, uh, got an occasional ride in a farm wagon. He made it back. And then after the war, after the Civil War, he became county court clerk of Bedford County, I believe. Didn't yes, he? when he returned to Fairfield, of course, he, like all the other Southern boys, was destitute. Uh, the slaves were all gone. The farm was in ruins. Uh, he was unable to work a farm with just one leg. Uh, and uh, so he hit on the idea of running for public office. He did. He ran for clerk of the county court of Bedford County. Uh, courthouse is in Shelbyville. Shelbyville is the county seat. He was elected, and he was re-elected over a period of about 30 years. Yeah. And then he eventually retired and moved his family, including my mother, who was then a little girl, back to Fairfield, where he lived out to his remaining years. He had one of the first walking horses, didn't he? Mm-hmm. He, uh, he rode, rode it in his work, or...? He rode it, when, yes, but he rode it when he was campaigning. He had oh, to I... run for re-election every two years. Yeah. And uh, in, in, to do so, he had to travel all up through the hills and the byways and mm -hmm. the back roads and talk to all the farm families, to the voters. <laughs> and uh, with one leg, he was unable to ride a trotting or a cantering yeah. horse. He finally found a mare that could walk very fast. She could walk about six miles an hour. And we've always claimed she was the original <laughs> and he was the big starter <laughs> of the Tennessee walking horse. And the Tennessee walking horse originally was any horse that could walk fast, yeah, right, fast right. walker. But now, of course, it's become a breed and a show horse. Mrs. Chapman, uh, what are some of your early memories of Middle Tennessee? Well, I lived with my great-grandmother and my grandmother out on the Gallatin Pike from the time I was 16 until I was married. And during that time, President Franklin Roosevelt came to Nashville, and they opened up the Hermitage and had a breakfast there at the dining room. My great-grandmother, Emily Donaldson Walton, was the hostess, and I was a page and stood behind her chair while they ate breakfast. <laughs> what was your impression of Roosevelt? Oh, he was the most handsome and fascinating man I'd ever seen. He, his manner of speech was quite unusual. Yes, too. he had a lovely voice. Uh, now, uh, how do, does your family trace back to the Donaldsons that married Andrew it, it Jackson. It goes back to Captain John Donaldson and his son Colonel John Donaldson, and they came down the river in a flatboat and founded Nashville. Yeah, mm -hmm. had quite a time of it yes. uh, coming down the river. Coming down the river, the Indians were chasing them, and they had to throw all the loose baggage overboard so they could go faster. And there was a baby wrapped up in a quilt, and they threw the baby overboard. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Yeah. Ms. Uh, Chapman, did you ever think uh, when you were serving President Roosevelt that years later you'd be taking care of a, a, another group of presidents? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was probably a cue then of things yes, that were going to maybe. come later General, on. General, how, how did uh, you, you graduated from the University of Florida. Now tell us how you got from Fairfield to Florida. <laughs> well, I was born in Florida. Yeah. My father was a Methodist minister there. We, as I said, we lived for a few years there when I was very young in Tennessee in Fairfield. Then we moved back to Florida after the World War I uh, and after my grandfather died. We'd come up so my mother could take care of my grandfather. That was the reason we'd moved up for a few years permanently. So I went to school in Florida, D-Land, Florida, and then to the university at Gainesville and graduated from the university. Uh, and the year I graduated, 1935, was the bottom of the Depression. Uh, the Marine Corps that year offered one regular second lieutenant's commission to the University of Florida and to the other 50 
land-grant colleges that had ROTCs. And I was fortunate enough to be the, the honor graduate of the ROTC at the University of Florida that year. I was a cadet colonel, and I was a commanding officer of an artillery regiment, cadet artillery regiment. And so I was fortunate enough to get that second lieutenant's so regular commission in 1935. Well, you both had an omen then. She got to deal with President Roosevelt mm -hmm. early, and then you did well with the well, yeah, I student got, corps and, at uh, mm -hmm. Gainesville. I'd never seen a Marine in my life. <laughs> well, tell when us. I became a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. But I've a seen a lot of second lieutenant. Yeah, we want to talk about that marriage <laughs> in a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> I've seen a lot of Marines since then. But. <laughs> well, tell me about those early experiences in the Marine Corps. Uh, they sent you to some type of officer school, I assume. Tell us what the Marine Corps was like then and uh, how they operated. The Marine Corps was very small in those days, uh, some 16,000 officers and men total. That's all. This was five, six years before World War II. A thousand officers and 15,000 enlisted. It was a very tight, elite, high quality little outfit with a tremendous amount of professional experience in the uh, officers and staff NCOs from World War I and from the uh, wars down in the Latin America, Caribbean, uh, Haiti, Nicaragua, El Salvador. Marines had been down there for years. Tell me about some of those old type Marines that you met that didn't Oh, I met those. people like Chesty Puller, uh, Sergeant Major Daly. Uh, Bigfoot Brown. Bigfoot Brown. <laughs> 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 and many others. Sergeant Major Daly had two medals of honor. Uh, Smedley Butler had two medals of honor. Uh, they, it was the, the, what we call then, what we now call the old corps, small professional outfit. What was your attitude toward these men who had done such outstanding service? Oh, I stood in all of them. They, their chests were covered with medals. Some of them, as I said, had two medals of honor, not one, but two medals of honor. Two or three Navy crosses, numerous silver stars. Uh, many of them had four or five Purple Hearts from World War I. Uh, we stood in all of them. We thought, wow. What type of, uh, it, you went to a school in Philadelphia or? Yes, that was the, the standard practice then. Second lieutenants immediately went to a school called the Basic School for Officers. It still is, it's still in existence. It's now at Quantico, Virginia. It's the standard training course for new Marine second lieutenants. It teaches them basically to be an infantry platoon leader. And all Marine officers, new second lieutenants, are required to go there. Uh, and uh, later, after they graduate from that school, then they go on to specialty training, like pilots for aviation, artillerymen, tankers, supply officers, signal officers, and the like. But every Marine officer, without exception, whether he's air or ground or sea, is trained as an infantry platoon leader. And it's one of the unique things about the U.S. Marine Corps. It's a tie that binds all Marines together because every Marine, whether he's flying an airplane or shooting a cannon, understands that 18-year-old infantryman that's carrying a rifle mm -hmm. and occupying the, the enemy ground that has to be taken and held to win. What uh, special emphasis in the area of psychology, let's say, did the Marine Corps impart to you and all other members? Uh, what, they seem to have well, a special attitude. Uh, what, what is it? There's a tie that binds all Marines together. No, no doubt about that. It's, it's unique. Uh, it's often referred to as a band of brothers. I think it comes on the part of the enlisted from the training at Paris Island, the boot training at Paris Island in San Diego, and with the officers, it's the basic school the initial school for all second lieutenants. It's very hard, very tough, very demanding, both physically and mentally, very challenging. Uh, the, uh, the drill instructors and the officer instructors strip each individual right down to his basics, including shaving his head <laughs> and, uh, and taking all his clothes away from him uh, <laughs> and issuing him a set of standard Marine Corps utilities and starting from the basic man, or boy many times, 17 and 18 year olds, 
and putting him through an incredibly rigorous and tough training period that lasts 12 weeks, at the end of which time, if he makes it, he's a designated Marine. Up to that time, he's a recruit. How does a Marine at that point look at himself? Oh, he's very proud of himself. I'm, I think what it does above all else is convince each rec recruit who becomes a Marine that he can do anything. There's no, nothing he can't do. There's no challenge, no problem he won't be able to solve. It gives them tremendous self-confidence. Not only in themselves, but confidence in their buddies, their fellow Marines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, when did, uh, no, you said you were going to ask them about their marriage. Uh, <laughs> when did that occur? Well, 1937, Christmas time. I was, uh, after graduating from basic school, I went to Quantico for a year with the artillery there in the old 1st Marine Brigade, Quantico, Virginia, that is. And then I was ordered to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, to the Army Artillery School for a nine month uh, uh, course of instruction. And uh, during the Christmas holiday, which lasted two weeks in 1937, I went back to Birmingham where Emily was waiting and we were married that Christmas season. Where did you meet Emily? In Quantico, Virginia at the Marine Corps. What in the world were you place. doing in Quantico? I was Virginia. visiting a cousin and he was the chaperone at a dance and I went with a younger fellow and I met him there. Well, what attracted you to the general there? He was just a young oh, lieutenant. Oh, as I said, he was a good-looking lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> I want to revert back to your youth again. Obviously, you've had confidence all your life, and you have to believe in yourself and know what you're doing to, to go up through the ranks like you did. What impact did your parents have on you as a child? Your father was, a, I believe, a Methodist minister, uh, and, and you had a military tradition in your background. How did that affect your thinking as a young man? Yes, my father was a Methodist minister for a number of years, and then uh, purchased and ran two different daily newspapers in Florida, and then he was appointed, he was elected to the state legislature, uh, served there a couple terms. He was Speaker of the Florida House his second term, and then he was appointed superintendent of the Florida prison system and served in that capacity for 25 years. He was a very distinguished gentleman. He was a really wonderful old southern type orator. He was a great orator, wonderful speaker. He had quite an influence on me, of course, and as did my mother, and particularly my mother's heritage here in Middle Tennessee, which I learned at her knee. and and uh, all the time I was growing up. So I guess we can say for both of you that from an early age on, your family was trying to get you out socially, build up your confidence, and uh, get an education for you, and, and get you off to a good start. Yes, that's true. We were very lucky. Let me uh, ask you about your early training again. How did you pick artillery as a specialty? I didn't. The Marine Corps picked it for me. I uh, had been in the artillery at the University of Florida, in the ROTC artillery, and uh, as you know. And uh, so when I joined the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps told me I was going to be an artilleryman. So I was an artilleryman from then on. Were you dealing with a lot of World War I weapons? Oh, yes. Entirely. Almost entirely. The old French 75s, the old 155 GPF. Uh, the only thing we had that was new was the Packhauser which was an army development, of course. It was a 75 millimeter howitzer. It was designed to break up into one and two man loads, hand carry loads. And the Marine Corps adopted it, of course, so we could get it ashore in an amphibious operation. Did you ever hear in the late 30s, was there much talk among Marine Corps personnel about the possibility of hostilities breaking out between this country and any other country? There was a lot of talk about the possibility of war in the Pacific, yes, with the Japanese. We had Marine officers who traveled through the Pacific and through Japan and, uh, and uh, explored the possibilities, the uh, strategic possibilities as well as the tactical po possibilities. At the Marine Corps schools in those days, uh, there was a study each year of a possible landing in the Pacific and how to make that landing, all the details, the technical details of getting ashore, the scheme of maneuver ashore, and all that. And among 
Um, and among the islands that were studied at the schools in that way were all the islands on which we actually landed just a few years later in World War II, uh, with one exception, and that was Peleliu. Mm -hmm. But Guam, Saipan, Tinian, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, uh, and the others uh, were studied at the Marine Corps schools well, we want in to talk preparation for a war that actually occurred. We want to talk about those a little bit later, but mm -hmm. when did you decide that you would probably want to make a career out of the military, particularly the Marines? Did you have that in uh, mind when you went in? Well, I was inclined toward the military, yes. I had several ancestors that were military, including my Confederate uh, veteran grandfather. His son was an army lieutenant. I have Revolutionary War officer ancestors. Mexican War? And uh, yes, Mexican War, but he wasn't an officer. He was, he was enlisted. He was uh, lost at the Alamo. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Uh, Chapman, what, uh, I'm sorry. Go, uh, go ahead, please. What was it like uh, after you got married and you found that you were on a Marine base? Was, uh, was it oh, kind it of was a shock very, to her? Or, uh, it was very exciting was always something going on, and people coming and going, met lots of good people that we laid us off from place to place. And you lost some of them too later yes, in the war, didn't you? Did. But was there sort of a camaraderie among the women? That yes, we all stuck together. Mm -hmm. So that, that goes both ways in the Marine Corps. Yeah, then, it? Yes, it does. Well, let's move on a little bit. The war came, and, and uh, in a way, Mrs. Chapman, you're a combat veteran also. You were. At Pearl Harbor at that time. Could you tell us about that? Yes, I was spending the weekend up in New Iwano Valley with a friend, and we were awakened by all this loud blasting. We thought there was blasting on the other side of the island, and we turned on the radio and found out we were being bombed. So we got in the car and went up to the top of one of the hills and could see these terrible flames and black smoke coming from Fort Island, and then we knew what had happened. What went through your mind as you watched all of that? Well, strangely enough, I wasn't frightened. I was just mad as I could be. <laughs> Did you see any of the Japanese planes? No, no. Yeah. It was too late for that. Yeah. Yeah. But the flames and the smoke kept coming up for days afterwards. And every now and then something else would explode on one of the ships and there'd be another loud blast. It was a horrible sight. Well, you must have known a lot of citizens and, of course, wives and whatever. How were those people reacting? It, well, a lot of people days. got on the next boat and went home, but I stayed out there for six months and lived in the blackout. And I was arrested one day for not taking my <laughs> gas mask downtown. Had to wear them every time you went out of the house. Was there real fear that there'd be a Japanese invasion of the islands? Yes, there was at one time. G uh, General, you were a captain then? Yes, I was a Marine captain. I was the CEO of a Marine detachment on board a heavy cruiser, the Astoria. We were a few hours steaming time out of Pearl Harbor when the Japanese attacked. We were headed into the harbor. Uh, it, uh, let's see, I'd, I'd had the mid-watch, the midnight, the fore-watch. I was the sky control officer. That means anti-aircraft officer. And, and I'd turned in at 4 a.m. to get a little sleep, and uh, after a couple hours, the we were in a different time zone. General quarters sounded, and I thought, what a ridiculous Sunday morning, you remember. I said, what a terrible thing to sound general quarters at this hour on Sunday morning and get me out of my sack. But I raced up to my battle station, and the captain of the ship came on the loudspeaker and told us all that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, and that it wasn't any drill, that they really had attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, I didn't know, you know, somehow we didn't really believe it. It seemed so incredible. But a little while later, over came a flight of airplanes. I'll never forget this. And so uh, they, the airplanes dropped some minute 100-pound bombs that didn't hit anything. And our sky control, our fire control for our anti-aircraft, we limbered up and shot at the airplanes. And we didn't hit anything either. <laughs> And the airplanes flew away, and as they were flying away, I identified them. They were U.S. Navy PBYs out on patrol. They'd bombed us, and we'd shot at them. So that convinced <laughs> us. That convinced us that that the war really had started. Well, when you get bombed by a PBY, you know something <laughs> must have happened. <laughs> when, when did it dawn on you, Mrs. Chapman, that uh, that your husband was in danger? Well, I knew that they were at sea which was a very fortunate thing 
And, uh, but it was four or five days before their ship came back into the harbor, and we didn't know what had happened. We didn't know whether the ship had been blown up or what had happened. It was a terrible time. What, uh, what sight greeted your eyes when you came into the harbor? Mm, yes, it was uh, three or four days after the mm. bombing. It was really a terrible sight, unbelievable. When we had left, of course, it was a beautiful harbor, neatly arranged, all the U.S. Navy warships docked or piered or tied up to buoys all around, airplanes on Fort Island, the Navy airstrip. Uh, it was just a terrible, chaotic shambles, you know, sunken ships, ships burning, airplanes burning and crashed, a thick scum of uh, oil all over the the nice harbor, nice clean harbor, terrible sight. Well, did, did you realize or did you think at all that this looked like this would be a long war, four years, that this could go on for an awful long time when you were looking at all that wreckage, no. that we were uh, in pretty well, bad yes. shape? Uh, we did realize that the aircraft carriers had not been touched. And uh, all of us, I think, were well enough up that we understood it was going to be an air war in the Pacific. In your, and it, uh, as it turned out, it, that, that's just what it was. In your opinion, on a scale from one to ten, what was the state of preparedness on the part of the United States? Uh, Material-wise, ships, airplanes, ammunition, supplies, I think we were in good shape. Our training was good. Uh, where we were poor was in uh, mental preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure we didn't have, I know I didn't, and most of us didn't have the slightest idea we were about to get into a war or that we were about to be attacked, in particular at a place like Pearl Harbor. So I think we were well prepared, material, training, but we weren't well prepared mentally. We were caught by surprise, and uh, it was a surprise. I th often think of uh, article I once read, written by a Navy captain who was at Pearl Harbor in the Naval Institute proceedings, describing the Pearl Harbor affair, and the, the uh, title of the article was, How Innocent We Were. <laughs> now, I think that's a very excellent title for yes. the way we were. You know, you saw quite a bit of combat, and I think at this time I'd like to read the uh, personal decorations that you've received through your career. So if uh, if you'd bear with me a moment, I mm -hmm. think our listeners would be interested in this. We have a Bronze Star with a Combat V. We have two Navy Distinguished Service Medals, two Legion of Merit Awards with Combat V, Navy Commendation Medal with Combat V, two Presidential Unit Citations, Order of National Security Merit Medal of Korea, and National Order of Vietnam. Let's talk about the first combat I guess you saw. Would that be the Coral Sea? Uh, yes. We, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, as, as I said, we went put into the harbor uh, a few days later, uh, supply, resupplied the ship, and sailed right out again. We were only there a few hours. Um, and we were ordered down to the South Pacific uh, to the Coral Sea, where we were. We cruised for some time. We visited several of the other islands. We did some bombarding of some of the Japanese installations. And then in company with the uh, Lexington and the, and the uh, Enterprise, the two aircraft carriers, we were the flagship. We were a heavy cruiser of the Astoria. We were the flagship of the task force. It's task force 17. Uh, we engaged the Japanese in the Battle of the Coral Sea, in which uh, we inflicted severe damage on on the Japanese fleet, uh, they also inflicted damage on us. They sank the Lexington, which uh, burned and sank. Uh, we, the Astoria, rescued uh, uh, many from the Lexington, including the entire Marine Detachment, who was commanded by one of my basic school classmates, mm -hmm. <laughs> Boozy Beerman. <laughs> and we picked him up along with his Marines and, and, uh, and, uh, got them to throw away their oily rags they were clad in, and we issued them all new Marine Corps uniforms, and we suddenly had a uh, double-sized Marine detachment on the Astoria. So that was the Battle of the Coral Sea. From there, we returned to Pearl Harbor for uh, one night, 
and again resupplied the ship and immediately went out the next morning to Midway where we participated in the Battle of Midway. We again were the flagship for Task Force 17. This time our carrier was the Yorktown. Uh, she was hit during that battle. You were still on. Sank. You, you were still on the Astoria. I was still on the Astoria. Yes. Could I was you still describe the, CO that, of the Marines. Could you describe the Astoria a little bit and what it that was Astoria like? Astoria was a heavy cruiser, one of the treaty cruisers. She had nine eight-inch guns, uh, eight five-inch anti-aircraft and bombardment guns, uh, numerous 50 calibers, 1.1s, 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Uh, she had an uh, eight-inch belt of armor all around her. She'd make uh, 33 knots, which is about 36 or 7 miles an hour, wide open on all eight boilers. Beautiful ship. Well, you felt After the Battle of Midway, I was detached from her and went on to other duties. She went down to Guadalcanal and was sunk at the Battle of, uh, of Savo Island during the Battle of Gu uh, Guadalcanal. Hmm. Well, you, you Marines were trained to fight basically on land. Weren't you guys pretty much ill at ease while all this was going on? You were, in a sense, sort mm -hmm. of trapped on a ship? Well, we were trained for sea duty as well, uh, not only for operating and fighting the ship, but also for uh, landing operations. We practiced that frequently. The Marine detachment would lead the way, and the detachment of sailors armed with, with uh, 03 rifles and hand grenades would follow behind. That's one of some of my most nervous experience was having a gang of armed U.S. sailors coming up behind you. <laughs> There's nothing more dangerous than a sailor <laughs> armed with a 45 caliber automatic. <laughs> U.S. sailor, that is. <laughs> well, the Battle of Midway has been written up as a very exciting, really as an air battle, wasn't it? Uh, it was a battle between aircraft carriers, yes. Uh, the, uh, the surface ships, the other ships never saw a Jap Japanese ship. We saw lots of Japanese airplanes, and we did a lot of firing at them. The Astoria had a very good record in uh, engaging Japanese aircraft. We shot down some, I believe it was uh, 17 total during the Battle of Midway from our one ship, the cruiser. So we had an excellent uh, sky control anti-aircraft. Well, all this air battle was going on above you. Know, what goes through a man's mind the first time he's really exposed to this type of thing. Oh, you don't have time to think about it. You don't do any meditating. You just uh, react in the way you've been trained to fire your weapon, control your weapons, uh, give the necessary commands, and uh, hope you do a good job. Well, when that was over at Midway, what went through your minds then? You realized you'd pulled off a big victory and there was sort of a quick turnaround from Pearl well, Harbor. Well, we didn't know on Astoria we were no longer the flagship. The flagship, the flag had moved to the Yorktown, to the aircraft carrier. Uh, we didn't know what the um, results of the battle were. We knew the Yorktown was hit and was sinking. Uh, we knew we'd lost a number of airplanes because we could count the airplanes that took off from our carriers and then count them returning and there was many fewer. But what the damage was to the Japanese fleet, we didn't know at that time. Of course, we found out later, and as everyone knows, historically, it was a major victory for us. We sank, uh, what was it, four Japanese aircraft carriers, several heavy caliber ships, and numerous destroyers. Mm -hmm. You must have felt good with the way uh, our men behaved in the opening round of the war like that. I guess you got to see a lot of chances of bravery and good conduct and what all we would call that under yes. fire. Well, of course, we were still a professional Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, we didn't have any yet, any of the wartime recruits. We were all uh, veterans of many years of peace and training. Uh, it wasn't until after Midway, beginning that fall, that the uh, newly uh, recruited and trained replacements started to arrive to build the ship's complements up to war strength and to, and to greatly increase the size of the Marine Corps. Although you were just a captain, uh, several command changes were made in Hawaii right after Pearl Harbor. Did, did, did the well, yes, men the commanding that, admiral and general were both relieved immediately after Pearl Harbor. Did the uh, men at your rank level have much comment or observation about that? No, we really didn't. There weren't any changes uh, that immediately affected us other than the captain of the Astoria, he was relieved and was replaced by the captain of the battleship Nevada. Uh, he had been on board the Nevada when the attack took place, 
he hadn't gone ashore. Remember, this was Sunday morning. Uh, and uh, when his ship was hit, he elected to get underway to see if he couldn't get out of the harbor. But a part way out, he realized he was going down. There's no way to get through the narrow channel. If he had tried, he would have sunk in the channel, and that would really would have been a problem. So he drove the Nevada ashore, and he was recognized for his exploits, and uh, he was immediately transferred over to our ship, the Astoria, and he became our captain. His name was Scanlon, and he was a first-class Navy combat officer. Ms. Chapman, you spent six months in Hawaii. Do you have some other recollections? What did you do to pass the time, and uh, how did oh, you keep busy? Oh, we went to the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which was all covered with barbed wire and rolled bandages all day long. And uh, everywhere we went, we had to take our gas mask, as I said. And uh, But th there was nothing to be frightened of at that time. We, we felt sure that the Japanese had gone. Uh, and we, we kept waiting for our husbands to come back on the ship. No food rationing or any problems along yes, that line? Yes, we had food rationing. Didn't have, and started gasoline rationing, I guess. Yes, but we didn't have our children then, so it was not a, much of a problem for me. The people with little children had trouble getting rations, and most of the ones with little children went back on the first ships that went back to the States. At that time, did either one of you have a sense of history that you were really being part of something that was uh, going to make a big change yeah. in the way of the world? And oh, yeah, certainly we did. We knew it was going to be a long war. After all, it was, you know, it was, we were at, uh, in the Hawaiian Islands. It was another 5,000 miles to Japan uh, and the uh, Far East. It was obvious it was going to take a long, long time. And uh, we knew that the events that were taking place were world-shaking. Of course, the war in Europe had been going on then for since 1939, oh, really. Uh, the uh, Germans were deep into Russia at that point. Um, the uh, Battle of Britain was going on, and the Germans bombed England for months, years. Uh, so the world, was, the world was in flame. We knew that. Now we were in it. Mm. Well, you both of you lived such exciting lives. Tell me about when you were transferred back to the States. You were assigned to training? Yes, I was uh, promoted to major during that time and ordered back to the Marine Corps schools at Quantico. Uh, we j we uh, arrived there. I joined Emily in Tennessee. She'd gone come back ahead, gotten back, back here to uh, Nashville, to Madison. Joined her here and we went on to Quantico where I was the executive officer of the, of the field artillery school, the Marine Field Artillery School, which had just started up mm -hmm. to train Marine second lieutenants to be artillerymen. We were there for uh, almost two years, and then I was ordered back to the Pacific to the 1st Marine Division. I want to ask you one question about training. Uh, all of a sudden, the Marine Corps must have been faced with a problem of trying to keep up their standards. You'd been, what, relatively small, 16,000 mm -hmm. or so, and now you had just thousands and thousands of men coming in. How was that yes. training handled and still try to maintain the... It must have been a rush to get these men through and trained as quickly as possible. And It was shortened in length from 12 weeks to about nine recruit training. The basic school was shortened from nine months to three months, but the days were made longer. So there was very little loss of actual training. It was just more intensive, more compressed, and therefore more difficult. But the Marine standards were not lowered at all during World War II uh, in the training, in the initial training. And they, well, they weren't lowered either during Korea or, or, or Vietnam. They were maintained throughout the war. You must so that what I'm the Marine sorry. Corps in World War II grew from about 17,000 just before the war to uh, 600,000 during the war. So there was a vast expansion. But the, the 600,000, six division, six air wing Marine Corps at the peak of World War II was officered and uh, staff NCO'd by the 16,000 veterans that had been in the Marine Corps when the war started. Mm -hmm. You anticipated that you would have to return to combat, I'm sure. It, it's, it's oh, yes. Good. Yeah. In fact, I was pretty impatient. <laughs> <laughs> sitting at Quantico <laughs> while Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Guam, Saipan, 
Off Penny Ann were going on. Oh, mm -hmm. well, what'd you think about all that? I'm sure you probably preferred to have your husband at home, didn't you? Mercy, yes. We uh, had these two sons, too, that were always going overseas, and my husband was going overseas, and it was a very trying time for a mother and a wife. Well, let, let's talk about Peleliu. That was one of the bloodiest battles of the war mm -hmm. and been a lot of controversy over whether that should have taken place or not. Uh, tell me about a Marine officer. You went in as a battalion commander at that time? Uh, yeah, no, not that not, one. Not that uh, no, I went in as the operations officer okay. of the artillery regiment. I was a lieutenant colonel then. Okay. I just arrived uh, in the 1st Marine Division where it was based for training in the Pavuvu Islands um, in uh, the summer of 44. We trained hard for the Peleliu assault, uh, and we moved to Peleliu in the amphibious uh, ships and, and uh, got into the landing craft, the amphibian tractors, and uh, made it ashore uh, as planned. It was a bloody battle. The Japanese were holed up in the coral caves. Uh, Peleliu is just a coral island. It's solid coral. Uh, and it have even has some pretty good little peaks, little uh, valleys and mountains, uh, hills. And they were threaded with Japanese caves. Every the Japanese had to be dug out of the caves one by one. It was pretty bloody. When you were going ashore in, that, in those amphibious craft, there must have been a considerable amount of tension, anticipation uh, going well, on. Well, yes. It's a nerve-wracking experience, all right, to ride an amphibian tractor ashore over a coral reef when you're under fire from machine guns and other weapons. Uh, but most of us made it. Uh, we could hardly wait to hit the beach and get out of that tractor. <laughs> <laughs> so he felt a little better on dry get in, land. Get into a hole somewhere where, <laughs> where you were a little safer. <laughs> Well, that's really what part of that was, wasn't it? From one hole to another, one cave to another? That's what it was on Peleliu. Yes, it was. Same thing was true on Saipan and to a considerable extent on Saipan and Tinian. Well, tell me about the Japanese soldier a little bit. That was a fierce competitor. The Japanese who... soldier was a good fighter, very good fighter. He was entirely willing to lay down his life, and most of them did. They almost never surrendered. <laughs> They had to be dug out one by one toward the end when they were offered the opportunity to surrender and promised that they wouldn't be harmed in any way. Very, very few of them. Let's talk did about so. the uh, Asian concept of war. That that was that must have been startling to some of some of what we'd call Westerners. This attitude of fighting to the last man, never give up. Uh, yeah, they just had a uh, sincere belief that they were dying for their emperor, for their country and that it was uh, the noble and right thing to do. Uh, and they did it. It made, them very, made it very difficult to, to defeat them and to dig them out. Did you know your, at the time the battle was taking place, did you know your husband was there? No. No, I didn't know where he was. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite strict censor, the letters that I got. And mm -hmm. uh, I had no idea. I've seen letters that my father was in the Marine Corps in the Pacific. I've seen letters that he's written home, and they're just great big sections that are just blacked out <laughs> yes. on there. Did you ever get any of those yes, type? Yes, cut out, too. Cut out and, yes. and blacked out. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the battle really wasn't publicized much at the time it was taking place? No, not, not at all. Not like today. No, well, I guess that was just as well, wasn't it, yes. that you didn't know? well, no. you knew something was going on, but not exactly what. Or who. Or mm -hmm. who. <laughs> There was the, uh, the, the announcement that the Marines had assaulted Peleliu would have been in the papers, and, but it, it would have been no statement of which outfit, 1st Marine Division, 2nd Marine Division, or who was the assaulting force. You've seen the press play a great role in wars. So what's your attitude about that? About, do you think that, that the way that that was censored or handled in World War II, you think that maybe that's the best way? or? Well, I think it was essential in World War II. It was essential to uh, keep secret where the next attack was going to be in the Pacific. Uh, we, and each time we had several choices. You know, when we went to uh, Guadalcanal, there were two or three other places we could have gone instead, and so forth for the various landings. The only ones that, the only two that were obvious 
was were um, Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. And of course, they were about all that was left at that point. Mm -hmm. But it was obvious they would be the next tag. But prior to that, there were always three or four different places that the next landing could be. And it was essential to keep that secret, of course. And it could only be done through censorship. I know combat veterans a lot of times don't like to dwell on what they saw uh, in a war like that. But you were on Peleliu for four weeks. Could you describe a little bit about the behavior and, and actions of men in battle over a period of stress over that long? And and talk about that a little bit. How much did you weigh when you went in there, and what did you weigh when you came off of there? You must have lost a lot of weight. And I did lose 15, 20 pounds, yes. We, uh, uh, we were on uh, short combat rations. They were adequate to keep body and soul together, of course. Uh, the infantry uh, got uh, better or more rations they, than they needed them. The artillerymen got less. Others, like tankers and supply people, they got even less. Uh, but it was sufficient. It was incredibly hot. There had been some foliage on the island, but it had all been blasted off in the bombardments. It was just bare, white, coral rock, and the temperatures were up above 100 degrees around the clock. It was terribly hot. Uh, so water was the main thing, not food. And it was quite a problem in keeping the water supplied to particularly to the infantrymen who were up digging the Japanese out of the caves. What about night fighting? Was a great deal of that? Uh, no, not after the initial landings. The first few days, there was a Japanese counterattack by night on, on a D plus two, I think it was, or three. Uh, but uh, that was the end of the night fighting. Uh, we didn't attack at night because it was more difficult at night to, to, to uh, assault those caves and to use the artillery and the other supporting weapons. So we'd uh, attack all day from first light until last light, uh, and then we'd secure for the night. Well, a lot of times mm -hmm. when you were fighting at those, could you actually see them? Yes, you could see them. I remember one particularly right on top of the tallest peak. They had a, an observation post up there, silhouetted, silhouetted against the sky. There was a, a Japanese, probably a staff NCO, or even an officer who would move out there at first light and sit on a stool on the top of that mountain. And we, we, and I'd observe what was going on. We tried every means we could think of to uh, keyhole that nip. <laughs> <laughs> we even fired a 155 gun at him. <laughs> he was at a range of about 2,000 yards. Well, I'm sure we scared him pretty bad because he must have thought there was a freight train coming by his noggin. But we never did hit him. Never did. Never did hit him. He stayed right up there till the very end. Finally, the Marines infantry got up to the foot of that particular hill. And with that, he went back into his hole. And I guess he died with the rest of them down in the cave. Hmm? Do you have any more recollections of stories like that? I know I'm. Well, there are lots of, you know, lots of stories about the bravery of the Marines. Yes. It's pretty hard to see mm -hmm. a close friend or comrade severely wounded or killed like that. Uh, how do you cope with that in combat, keep your sanity and you're under tension, pressure, and keep going? I guess that Well, it's just, just what you have to do. It's, what, it's your part of your That's training, is what you have it? to do, yeah. What? Um, there were, of course, heavy casualties. The infantry companies went in with the 220 strong, and, and they came out with perhaps 50 of their original members at the most. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was true in the other assaults, too. Now, it, was, uh, it was the usual experience that the infantry would suffer now we're 16, seeing, 70 percent casualties. We're seeing a lot of uh, nostalgia, I guess, about World War II and groups of veterans returning to the mm -hmm. site of the action. I'm sure you've kept up with all of that. Uh, what, what do you well, think when yes. you read about that and you see about it? Do you have any desire to return to some of those places? No, none. I, of course, I've been back to Okinawa several times um, as in the course of official business since then. But I haven't been to the, any other places. I haven't been back to Guadalcanal or Peleliu, uh, and I don't intend to go. I have no desire to see it. There's a film out now about Iwo Jima and the mm -hmm. groups of veterans. You may have seen that one where the groups of veterans, yes. and it seems like there's a lot of reluctance on the part of some of them to go back. In, in, in one sense, they want to go back, but there's something else telling them that they don't want to. I they think so. To. They just don't want to, like I, they just don't want to see the scenes of that 
of uh, you know that terrible fighting, terrible loss of life, uh, loss of friends and fellow Marines. We have about ten minutes left in this segment, so mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit on on uh, what happened next. That was a bad experience uh, at Peleliu, but you knew more was coming, didn't you? Well, halfway through the Peleliu battle, I was moved to be the commanding officer of one of the artillery battalions, one of the 105 millimeter howitzer battalions, a direct support battalion. And uh, we fought the rest of the I fought the rest of the battle with my battalion. At one point, we were converted into infantry, into an infantry battalion, and occupied a portion of the lines and uh, did some cave digging ourselves. But when the island was finally declared secure and the last Jap had been dug out of his cave, we went back to being an artillery battalion. Uh, we loaded aboard uh, an LST, all the, art, all the weapons and equipment, went on LST and the men and I, most of the men and I, went on a, a Dutch uh, transport steamer, believe it or not, and we all steamed back to Pavuvu in the in the uh, Palau Islands, where uh, we resumed training for the next uh, operation, which was to be Okinawa. You still didn't know what was going on back in the States, did you? No, and at the same time, I had two brothers who were in the 8th Air Force in Europe, and they were both shot down on the same day, December the 24th, during the Battle of the Bulge. And one brother was killed, the other brother was a German prisoner, but we didn't hear what had happened to him for months. We didn't know. And that was at the same time my husband was over in the Pacific. Yeah, you know, they were both fighter pilots. One flew a, flew a P-51 and the other flew a P-38. Mm. So that was emotional and strain. they were both aces, too. Emotional strain on the home front mm -hmm. as well. Tell me a little bit about what it was like uh, at home, uh, the rationing, uh, what did you do to pass the time? And Well, I had two active sons to keep up with, <laughs> you know, what that's like. And all of our older relatives were so upset, so emotionally upset, I tried to stay calm. So you stayed calm by staying busy? Yes, that's the best way. <laughs> did you get much mail from home, General? Was it hard? Did the, did the, did the no, mail the get mail through? the mail service was good, yes. We, I got letters regularly, and I wrote every day. Mm -hmm. Usually just a little note, but under censorship you couldn't say much. But I would just say, I'm fine, we're training hard, be back when the war's over. Hmm? Well, did they ever, I know it's sort of a silly <laughs> question, but did, did you ever get anything like socks, cookies, or anything from home? Did that stuff ever come through occasionally? Or? Uh, no, occasionally there would be a care package. <laughs> you got that <laughs> out-of-bound comfort, didn't you? Yes, I did. I got a, a comforter. <laughs> uh, that eventually got to me through the mail. It was nice to have. But we were well supplied. We really didn't need anything from home. Let's uh, spend the uh, last few minutes on this part. On uh, We've got five minutes left on, on Okinawa. Tell me about mm -hmm. your experiences there. What was that Well, like? I was a battalion commander. I was lieutenant colonel, artillery battalion commander, direct support battalion. We supported the 7th Marine Infantry Regiment, commanded by a very distinguished Marine, then a colonel named uh, Edwin Snedeker. Uh, we were, we landed in the assault right behind the infantry. I was in the seventh wave. Uh, we, uh, we landed, as everyone knows, without opposition. Much to our surprise, we'd expected to have a bitter battle right at the water's edge, just as we had on all the other islands in the Pacific. But the Japanese had elected not to defend the beaches, but to set up a defensive line a little way to the south across what's called what was called the Shuri Castle Line, and to defend that line and hold the southern half of the island, southern third of the island, which contained the harbor at Naha, uh, the airfields, and uh, most of the population. The northern part was largely wilderness and uninhabited. That was their battle plan. It was a surprise to us. We, as I said, I thought we, the beaches would be defended. Uh, they were, there was only a token defense. Uh, it somewhat confused us in that uh, our battle plan, our landing plan, provided phase lines that went up through about D plus 10 with a phase line each day and we were, that we were to reach each of the su successive days after the landing. Well, we got the D plus 10 line on the first day 
And we didn't have a plan for what to do after D plus 10 because we hadn't expected to get there for 10 <laughs> days. <laughs> so we were, we were pretty confused. But we straightened that out pretty fast. Well, the experiences you had on there in many cases were similar to what you went through at Peleliu, I guess. Yes. Once we turned south, came up against the Japanese prepared defensive line across the Shuri Castle mountain range, then the real fighting started. And it was very similar to the others, to Saipan, to Guam, Peleliu, Tarawa. It was just inch by inch against dug-in sites, against caves, blockhouses, pillboxes, uh, against an enemy that was completely out of sight uh, and hidden and firing out through openings. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you one question to conclude this part. The longer you survived in combat, did you begin to think that the odds would start to work against you, that your number would come up one day? If the war, everybody knew, everybody knew if it goes on long enough, my number is bound to come up sometime. You just don't know when. Of course, you don't, of course you don't know when. Uh, you hope it'll be later, but you don't know. Did you have uh, a notion that, did you believe, we've got time, did you believe that, that, that you men would have to get together for an actual invasion of Japan? Were you anticipating oh, yes. that? Yeah, that was our next uh, plan. Uh, we were uh, part of the Olympic operation that was to be the next operation. Uh, my division, the 1st Division, 1st Marine Division, was to land in southern uh, Hanshu uh, and uh, assault. And we knew that uh, there would probably be something like a half a million American casualties at a minimum to assault and take the main Japanese island of Honshu. Probably be several million Japanese casualties. We expected that every Japanese, man, woman, and child, would defend their homeland to the death. And they would have. <laughs> well, this concludes part one of our discussion with General Leonard Chapman and his wife, Emily.